right? Awesome. Hey, church. So, so, so blessed to see you here. Thank you so much. Thank you for your prayers for our family. And um, if you weren't here this morning, if you haven't heard, my mom is in heaven and um, went home to be with the Lord on Thursday. And uh, so we're just in the midst of processing through all of that and, uh, and yet at the same time really delighted and, and blessed uh, to be here tonight, right? Right. Is your mic on? I think so. Yeah, yeah. there you are. Um, so I love this topic. <laughs> didn't want to miss it. Don't know what Emily has against it. She, she didn't come tonight. She's a no-show, but... I'm sure all will be worked out there in their home. They have children that have needed children. someone to watch oh, them. Oh, okay, yeah. I've heard that before. Um, and thank you to Sweet Esther, who's been slaving away in the church kitchen, putting together a blueberry crisp, I'm told. Wonderful little dessert treat to follow. And um, some ice cream and some fire pits out there and a coffee bar will be open and if you're new to this whole thing welcome thrilled to have you uh pastor bob and bonnie i think this is september october november december this is session five and we've mixed it up a little bit because session six actually falls on super bowl weekend and um, so we won't meet that weekend on a Sunday night, but we'll combine our services uh, into the subject matter of marriage and talk about it together. In fact, you'll be sharing uh, the message with me that weekend and uh, going to be contributing quite nicely, you are, to that. But we didn't necessarily want to involve the entire church family into tonight's topic. Right. So we mixed it up a little bit and moved some things around. So uh, tonight is sex, and not just sex, but sexy sex. I, I think it's sweet Oh, sex. sweet sex. I knew it was an S, but uh, I'll go with that. That's, that's sweet, sweet sex. And, uh, and guys, there's uh, an issue that the enemy, Satan, would love to use to rob you of the joy of sweet sex, and that's called lust. And so we're going to unpack scripture together and take a look at that. But I love what Spurgeon says. Spurgeon was, for many people, referred to as the prince of preachers. And if you've never read anything by him, January would be a wonderful month to pick up one of his devotionals. He's got one called Morning and Evening. And it'd be twice a day that you could enjoy just some of the great uh, wisdom, insight, and nuggets that uh, Charles Spurgeon provided back in the 1800s. And I think we have that available for you even this evening in the bookshop, morning and evening, or anything you can grab uh, by Charles Spurgeon. But one of my favorite quotes that Spurgeon says is on the screens. And he says this, it should be the husband's pleasure to please his wife. And everyone said? Amen. Spurgeon, rocking the truth. And uh, that's an absolutely wonderful thing for us to keep in mind and uh, take to heart and put into practice and keep our, our hearts and our minds pure before the Lord who has given us this great gift of sex, sweet sex, sweet sexy sex. In fact, you have a little joke to go along with that to get us going tonight and then we're going to uh, split up, give each other a hug, and uh, gals are going to go with you to the theater. Guys are going to move up here to the front with me in the sanctuary, and we'll meet better for it out in the courtyard over some blueberry crisps. Awesome. But you are quite the joke teller. I'm so not. <laughs> <clears throat> I happened to share one joke with him. Oh, you need to read that. You need to tell everyone that. Yeah, story. yeah. So, in the future, I'll just keep my jokes to myself. <laughs> All right, you want me to do this? Yeah, but leave that up on the screen, because okay. I just think that's the most awesome quote ever. Okay. A therapist has a theory 
that couples who make love once a day are the happiest. So he tests it at a seminar by asking those assembled, how many people here make love once a day? Half the people, half. Half the people raise their hands, each of them grinning widely. Once a week, a third of the audience members raise their hands, their grins a, less, a bit less vibrant. Once a month, a few hands tepidly go up. Then he asks, okay, how about once a year? One man in the back jumps up and down, jubilantly waving his hands. The therapist is shocked, shocked and this disproves his theory. If you make love only once a year, he asks, why are you so happy? The man yells out, today's the day. Today's the day. Oh my God. Today's the day. Did you get me? I got you. All right, ladies, you are dismissed for a session on sweet sex. We'll see you after. Guys, come on up to the front and join me. Grab your Bibles if you need one. They're in the rack in the back. And we'll open God's Word together. Awesome. All right. Open your Bibles, guys, with me to Psalm 16 as you're making your way up. Psalm 16. I got this for my birthday. I thought it was absolutely spot on appropriate for tonight. Little sweet sex, silly string. Guys, you got a handout tonight, some homework there for you, some verses to look up. In fact, the top of it there says, uh, no longer pray to the lies of lust. Uh, there really isn't a guy here that isn't challenged by this, and so I'm so thrilled that you're here for it, and, and uh, we'll pray in a moment, but then, you know, you got a month here, don't feel like you got to do all this in, in one session or uh, one evening or one day. I just gave you as many as I could and would love for you to write in your own words uh, what the following scriptures are teaching you about conquering lust. And it just would be really all over the map, from the Old Testament to the New Testament and into the book of Psalms and Proverbs, and uh, some we'll look at tonight, but certainly going to barely scratch the surface on this whole deal. Um, but hope to this evening, even as you're turning there to Psalm 16, uh, have you grab the outline. So you have the homework page, a bunch of scripture, and then on the back, some things to fill in and... Uh, a prayer to pray. I'd love for you to pray it out loud. This wonderful prayer at the end there by uh, Augustine. Just a wonderful prayer that I found. And, um, and then grab this, if you would. Just the outline for tonight. And we're going to haul through this together. And uh, I won't keep you long, but there's a lot to discuss. And I've uh, broken it down into some, some, some key points and uh, categories for us. And it mainly is something that you can fill in as we go along, and uh, even more effectively, it'll help to keep me on track uh, in the midst of all that uh, swimming around in my heart and in my head. So we're going to look at the purpose, the process, the principle, and then practically look at the psalmist himself, David, and the steps of his downfall, and then the pursuit of realizing that that's the same strategy to which Satan uh, is employing against us and not just David and um, what we need to be very very keen and aware of that's described for us by then the results of David's sin ultimately that Solomon discusses in Proverbs chapter 7 uh, we'll fill some things in where that's concerned and then a great promise at the end uh, to wrap up our time with together amen so, Lord Jesus, we just thank you for all that are here tonight and the marriages that are represented, the families and the households, the prayer, Lord, over each master bedroom that you would be the master, that you would have full reign and authority uh, over our homes and over our minds and over our hearts, Lord, and over our marriages. And even if there are men here tonight that are single, this applies because ultimately we're all married to you. We're the bride of Christ. 
and how much is the enemy attempting to discourage us and and to distract us uh, with the cares and the loves of this world that end up choking out the truth of the seed of your love and so we pray against that strategy in the strong name of Jesus tonight we bind the enemy and pray Lord that we'd be open to the move of your spirit and just liberating us from maybe even the chains of pornography and of lust and of things that have so diluted and and limited what you're desiring to fulfill and perfect and complete and accomplish in our hearts in our lives in first and foremost our walk and relationship with you and the greatest expression of that relationship is our marriage and so would you do a miracle tonight Lord would you bless us uh, with your ability because ours falls short Lord just fill these men with your Holy Spirit and we just pray your spirit of purity and holiness would just come to reside in our hearts and in our minds and we give you this time to speak truth into our lives that Lord it would bring forth a great celebration and harvest of fruitfulness in our marriage for your glory in Jesus name and everyone said amen I love this Psalm Psalm 16 and it's a great one where the subject matter of lust is concerned David says preserve me O God for in you I put my trust why don't you guys say that with me just verse 1 why don't you declare it let's say it out loud ready preserve me O God for in you I put my trust O my soul you have said to me Lord you are my God my goodness is nothing apart from you as for the Saints who are on the earth they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight that's what the Lord has said that's what the Lord is desiring to see in us to grow and to mature and to become the excellent ones in whom is all my delight their sorrows shall be multiplied who hasten after another God their drink offerings of blood I will not offer nor will I take up their names on my lips O Lord you are the portion of my inheritance in my cup you maintain my lot and the lines have fallen to me in pleasant places yes I have a good inheritance you need to keep that in mind because that's exactly what the enemy wants to rob us of I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel my heart also instructs me in the night seasons and I've set the Lord always before me there's the challenge every time you open up a screen on your laptop or on your computer or or on your phone it really should be with this when you're traveling I've got guys still to this day who find themselves now coming out of COVID and going back out on the road a lot of them absolutely stir crazy in the couple of years in which they were locked down at home and are now out and about and, and tearing it up and 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 then feel as a result this wave of temptation that comes upon them when they're traveling and I've shared many stories with you about how the Lord has just supernaturally intervened and, and, and saved guys plucked them out of the flames of hell that have really tried through lust to destroy their marriages and uh, I still have guys to this day that when they're on the road they'll check in with me they'll email me straight right to me pastor Bob at horizon.org they'll be like hey I'm in Tampa I am in New York I'm in Boston I'm in Chicago hey, I'm up in Seattle pray for me and we'll just we'll just covenant together in that moment I got a text while Isaac was leading worship from a good friend of mine a son whose dad is in the midst of all sorts of crazy challenges right now and he said I know your mom has died 
I know church is just crazy busy, but is there any way? And I'm like, I'll call your, I'll call your pops tomorrow. And that's what we need with each other, to hold one another accountable, to be there for each other. And that's what our men's ministry is all about, guys. Jump in and be a part of one of those groups. And they're not there to scold you or to make you in any way feel relevant or, or, or an outsider. They're, they're meant to include you and embrace you and walk through the challenges of life with you that ultimately these scriptures could be fulfilled in your life and you would experience the good heritage and inheritance that the Lord has you're not meant to do it alone following Christ is not a one-man sport it's a team effort and we need each other come on say amen and the fact that you're here tonight is a blessing to everybody else in the room so thank you for that and when you get tempted in the night seasons, you should be able to have that accountability partner that you can call. If you don't know Steve Armendaris' story and testimony, you need to hear his story. Because now, more than being up top and helping guys reaching down and lifting them up, he's been down there in the pit. And down there in the pit, he now has this ability through what God has so sovereignly chosen to redeem coming alongside and helping other guys in the midst of their night season. I have set the Lord always before me. My heart instructs me in the night seasons because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. What a psalm. Hallelujah. Now, again, none of us have perfected this, including the one who writes the psalm. David has experienced failure in this regard. And so knows all the more of the importance to which these verses would declare the need that we have so that verse 9 could be experienced. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope so when we get restless when we start wanting to let our flesh dictate how life is to be lived instead of dying to the flesh we continue to feed the flesh and here as a result of that our heart becomes sick instead of glad and the glory then seems out of reach that we should be rejoicing in we're not resting in the hope we come we become very restless when we get our minds and our eyes and our hearts off of the lord but here's his promise to us even tonight guys verse 10 for you will not leave my soul in sheol nor will you allow your holy one to see corruption david declares he says in what is it psalm 51 don't remove your spirit from me You will show me the path of life, and in your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That ought to completely solve the masturbation problem. At your right hand our pleasures forevermore. That ought to keep our hearts and our eyes fixed on the Lord. Our minds not pulled down into the gutter, but allowing the Lord to complete in us the victory that He promises. And so fill this in. I, I, I hope that it would be a prayer that you would that you would be praying as you, as you fill, the, fill this in, to, to open our hearts to much needed counsel. That's what David says here. That's what this psalm is about. To open our hearts to much needed counsel, claiming his achieving victory over sin. He's the one. It's not us in our own strength, no way. But in Christ, and in Christ alone, as Isaac sang, claiming together 
the achieving victory over lust. And incidentally, this, this verse 11 here in Psalm 16, fill this in. The pleasures forevermore that he's talking about there, pleasures forevermore. And sometimes it's what lust does, it wants you to just like to trade in and exchange or actually cash in early the chips of enjoying pleasures forevermore for this moment of sin. And so the pleasures forevermore are experienced on the other side of dying to ourselves. That's what Paul says. He uses that old English, absolutely wonderful word when Paul says, reckon the old man dead. Now, when my mom's dad was alive, he'd use that word, I reckon. That's not the way Paul's using it. When my grandpa would use, I reckon, it was sort of like, I guess so. That's how they used to say it back there. He says, I guess, I reckon. And Paul doesn't want any guy tonight leaving here thinking or saying, well, I, I, think, I've, I think I've put to death the flesh. No, the reckoning is to drive a stake through it. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. Hard to lust. When I've died to self, hard to lust when I've died to flesh, hard to lust when I've driven a stake through it, reckon the old man dead, slay it, have a funeral, bury yourself in the backyard. To the extent that your wife's coming out saying, what are you doing, honey, what are you doing? You got like this crazy little shoe box, yeah, I'm putting myself in it, burying my flesh and the lusts are going underground. So that the pleasures forevermore that the Lord is promising to bless us with the victory that is found over lust and over sin could be experienced in our lives. It is all found on the other side of dying to self. So what's the process with that? We'll turn to Matthew chapter 5. The process here of seeing that purpose fulfilled in our lives is spoken to us in Matthew chapter 5 by the Lord. And he says to us in Matthew chapter 5, Beginning in verse 27, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you for it's more profitable for you that one of your members perish, that be in your eye, than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand, remember, pleasure forever, at your right hand, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members, that being now your right hand and your eye, that they would perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. So, there, right there, is the process, and you're like, ah! Like, how can we leave here tonight without being dismembered? How can we as men leave here in victory tonight, not looking like a bunch of Johnny Depp pirates with patches on our eyes, and and one of our limbs missing, because we've had to cut it off. Certainly doesn't want you seeing you. You, 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 you going off and, and taking that, you know, like literally and cutting your hand off. But it does show you the importance that God, God is placing on the need for this to then be lived out in our hearts and lived out primarily that it just wouldn't be your eye and it just wouldn't be your right hand, but it would be your flesh entirely. that is put on the cross and in its place you would see yourself it wouldn't just any longer be you seeing Jesus dying on the cross for you you'd see you dying with Christ on the cross realizing that he's the only one that can provide the propitiation the the acceptable sacrifice holy atonement before a righteous and perfect God because there's sin in your blood There's no sin in his. So he had to take our place on the cross 
But then he says to us tonight, you want victory? Join me. Paul says, I've been crucified with him. It's no longer I who live. Not being lived by the flesh. I'm not being guided and directed by the the lusts. The lust of the eyes. the, The lust of the world and the pride of life. That is the entire strategy and enemy of the Antichrist that we looked at in this morning's messages or last night if you come Saturday night I love the vibe of Saturday and I love all of our services but man there's a sweetness to the family that meets on Saturdays and uh, you might you, you, you might be interested in considering that it's just awesome that's the core and Sundays is great too I don't mean to knock it but you know sometimes I think what the Lord is doing even tonight in our midst is not necessarily things that I can address completely and candidly in a in a mixed audience this is why we've effectively decided to take the gals over with the gals and and for us as guys then to be able to really look at these things and so looking at them together here's what i've come up with fill this in it's not only men but mainly there's some women i realize that probably would benefit from a a good discussion regarding the issues of lust. It's not just men, but it's mainly men. It's, 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 it's mainly our issue. And it's not only sex that you're lusting after. Some of you, it's absolutely cold, hard cash. Or it's that brand new car that you saw in the parking lot pulling in so it's not only men but it's mainly men and it's not only sex but it's mainly sex it's not only your eyes but it's mainly your eyes and it's not only desire but it's mainly desire mainly men so I'm just trying to redeem the time as much as I can because we could go off into all sorts of gender confusion type issues that are now uh, wanting so much in this society to 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 reshape and and refashion the 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 minds and the hearts and the lifestyles of your kids and your grandkids I mean maybe that needs to be a session in and of itself Tonight, I've just kind of felt like it'd probably be best, you know, we could probably do a whole session just on homosexuality, what the Bible says about it, and how pertinent it is, and how relatable it is, and just how relevant it is to which God addresses throughout Scripture, Old and New Testament. But for the most part, I thought that it would be valuable for us to talk to married men who are heterosexuals about the fact that the most Blatant issues concerning lust are involving men, not just men, but mainly men, and it's mainly sex, and it's mainly your eyes, and it's mainly desire. And so here's the principle. Look at James chapter 1. The principle for the process to which the Lord Jesus has given to us Uh, would then be presented by James when he says in verse, I'm going to back up verse 12 and say this, and then we'll get to verse 14. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he'll receive a crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. That's, That's the goal. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God. God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. That's kind of the thing, that if it hasn't so much been categorized in your heart and in your mind as a, as a desire, and, 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 and so then this, this becomes the issue. We start parsing words, like we go, you, know, you get back to the Sermon on the Mount and here Jesus is saying, hey, You've heard it said, if you, you know, commit adultery. It's like, but I tell you, if you've even looked at her, 
And you're like, okay, well, I looked at her, but I didn't look at her with lust. And so that's what I mean. It's not only desire, but it's mainly desire. It can be, it can be straight up tonight being justified in your heart and mind as you just needing a release. You just needing a break. You just looking for entertainment. And you got the whole thing justified up and down the flagpole like nobody knows and it's not hurting anybody and it actually is none of your business, Bob. And yet it becomes all of our business when you get to James chapter 1 that the Lord is saying, I'm looking at all this, you guys, and I have a crown of life that I want to bless you with. I've promised to bless you with this. So let no one say it's coming from me. I'm not being the one who, who's tempting you. God can't be tempted by evil, nor is he tempting anyone with it. It's all conniving, jacked up, thinking in our own heads and here he comes down to the whole crux of the matter in verse 14. Look at verse 14. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. Don't be deceived, my beloved brethren. And so here under the principle on your outline, in very, very small print, I must confess, let me hold it out here so I can read it, is the definition of lust. It is the rejecting of desires that untether us from purity in Christ, fixated on the wrong object, out of proportion or unsuited as to disorder our thoughts or our feelings our behaviors resulting in damaging consequences relationally of all sorts and on all levels. And speaking on behalf of your bride, uh, it, it is absolutely something that is super violating to the trust of your marriage and relationship. And those behaviors, when they're just kind of allowed to go on, this disorder of thoughts, and fixated on the wrong object, which can so easily happen in this society, certainly happens to David. Let's look at his life. Because in 2 Samuel chapter 11, we're given the steps of his downfall. You know the story. And we're told here in 2 Samuel chapter 11 that there was actually an assignment that David had failed to sign up for. He'd failed to show up for it. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, beginning in verse 1, it starts by saying, it happened in the spring of the year. That's when things thaw out. That's when things start to sprout. And in the spring of the year, which was also the time that the ground begins to thaw, the snow begins to melt... You know, I think it was all the way up until, I don't know, someone can text me later and give me the accurate date, but it really wasn't all that long ago that this New Year's celebration that we all enjoyed a couple of weeks ago was in March, after the snow, after the winter solstice, after, you know, it kind of passes from being pitch black at four in the afternoon. In fact, the whole tax season of of, of, of having the tax day be in April was associated with that being the season of the new year. And it was at the season of the new year when the kings would go off and fight their battles after the snow had melted, when the days were getting a little bit longer. But David fails to show up for his assignment. It happened in the spring of the year at the time when the kings would go to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with them, all of Israel. They destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, but David, big butt. David remained at Jerusalem. So you can fill this in with me on your outline. The first step in his downfall is he skips out. Then what happens? It happened one evening, verse 2, that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful to behold i think we have a sketch this old time picture 
dating way back to which then would describe what David appears to enjoy seeing from the balcony of his roof to which a number of movies have been made, one actually by the title of David and Bathsheba. Here's, here's a shot. Like if that, right, I'm not showing you anything. Some of you are like, ah! Okay, we'll stop with the slides. But here he gets to the point of realizing, that movie was in 1951, by the way, that what he has now skipped out on has caused for him to see what he shouldn't be seeing. Step two in the downfall of David, he skips out, and now he sees. And there isn't anything you and I can do about the first sight, but we can control whether or not we give in to a second sight. He skips out, and then he sees. Thirdly, he sends. Verse three, David sent and inquired about the woman. You want to know how to destroy your marriage? 2 Samuel chapter 11. Instead of learning from the footsteps of David, you follow in the footsteps and you skip out where you should be. Isn't that crazy? In Pacific Beach, even tonight, there is a bar called The Office. So that it could just, I guess, I don't know, be justified by too many goofballs. Well, I'm just needing to stop by the office. He skips out, he sees what he shouldn't have seen, and and he sends for her. He sent and inquired about the woman. Now look at this. Verse 3 goes on, and someone said, is that not Bathsheba? That someone cared about David. That someone cared about David's marriage. That someone cared about David's future. That someone cared about the consequences of David's sin. That someone goes unnamed in the story, but that someone is being spiritually, divinely directed by the Lord. You need a friend like that in your life. Someone who can speak truth into you in the midst of it that it could like cut off Satan's plans, like cut it off at the pass. Yeah, maybe you've skipped out. Maybe you've seen what you shouldn't have seen. Maybe you're just checking out at Vaughn's and you can't help but look at some rag of a magazine that's staring back at you with something far worse than the slide of Bathsheba behind some screen. But worse is, he gets sucked in, hook, line, and sinker, and now sends for her. Someone says, hey, we, we hold on. Breaks, pal. You're the king of Israel, man. You're anointed by Samuel. Isn't that somebody else's wife? That's Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And David blew off the council and sent messengers and took her. And she came to him, and he lay with her, and she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, and so she sent and told David and said, I'm with child. He skips out, he sees what he shouldn't see, he sends for her, and he sidesteps the council. Blows it off. Don't care whose, hus- whose wife it is, or who the husband is, or, or, or any, any sins, and now she has to send back the message that she is now with child. Verse 5, I'm with child. And so David sent to Joab saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. See, one sin spawns another, and now having sinned, he spins it. And says, we got to find a way to cover this up. And so I know what I'll do. I'll have Uriah the Hittite The husband of Bathsheba, I'll I'll have him brought to the front lines and I'll have him killed. And prior to that, he has him come and 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 uh, and fills him up with food and and drink, tries to get him drunk, and 
says, well, you should go see your wife, you know. And, and uh, Uriah goes, not a chance, man. I'm not, I'm not doing that. Verse 9 says, Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants and his lord. Didn't go down to his house. They told it to David saying, Uriah didn't go down to his house. Did you not come from your journey? Why did you not go to your house, man? Uriah said, the ark and Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents. and You want me to go sleep in my own king-sized bed with my wife? I'm not doing it. As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do that thing. David's in a bind, a further bind, which spawns yet another sin and he spins it. And so all of this, you know, for you and I, becomes the lesson of the hour. The moment then for us to learn from and see actually where it takes him. And ultimately what Nathan has to sit down and deal with where David's sin is concerned. And that then becomes what David sadly is known for. But the Lord, according to Psalm 16, the Psalm of David, is able to even in our sinful state restore and forgive us bring us back into a rightful standing and fellowship with him because of his grace hallelujah and that's absolutely wonderful that what david is known for even more than this debacle of sin and the steps that led to his downfall he's known as a man after god's own heart that's who I want to be, guys. That's who I want you to be. That's who the Lord wants to see all of us be. And so in Proverbs chapter 7, he shows us the pursuit of the door that we need to avoid in now learning together from the steps of David's downfall. And he says to us in Proverbs chapter 7, he says... Um, at the window of my house, verse 6, I looked through the lattice. Not just David's issue. Like all of us can be tempted like this. And we can easily, sadly, it's become so incredibly convenient. When we were kids, when we were little boys, you had to smuggle that Playboy magazine somehow out from dad's den or out from grandpa's basement or out from the bottom shelf at 7-eleven you don't even have to go to that trouble anymore now it's just readily available to be clicked and opened on your screen yet here it's that window that i looked through my lattice and i saw among the simple perceived among the youth a young man devoid of understanding passing along the street near her corner and he took the path to her house. And in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and in the dark night, there a woman met him. With the attire of a harlot and a crafty heart, she was loud and rebellious, and her feet would not stay at home. And at times she was outside, and at times in the open square, lurking at every corner. And she caught him, and she kissed him, and with an impudent face said to him, I have peace offerings with me. I've got what you need. And today I've paid my vows and I, I've come to meet you and diligently to seek your face and I have found you and I have spread my bed with tapestry and colored coverings of Egyptian linen, luring him in. I've perfumed my bed with myrrh and aloes and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. My husband is not at home. He's gone on a long journey. Taking a bag of money with him, he'll come home on the appointed day. All is well. No one will know. And with her enticing speech, she caused him to yield. And with her flattering lips, she seduced him. This is lust. This is the harlot of lust. Immediately he went in after her as an ox goes to the slaughter. Pretty graphic, graphic enough. If not, doubles down as a fool to the correction of the stocks. Till an arrow struck his liver 
As a bird hastens to a snare, he did not know it would cost his life. Lust isn't a game, guys. It literally is the strategy of the enemy in hell to destroy you. Cost his life. Therefore, now listen to me, my children. Pay attention to the words of my mouth and don't let your heart turn aside to her ways. Don't stray into her paths. It's not worth it. For she has cast down many wounded, and all who were slain by her were strong men. Her house is the way to hell, descending to the chambers of death. Well, that's pretty clear. That's pretty graphic. That's, that's to the point that we can't skip out and just like merrily find our way to the hooker's house. And allowing lust to have its way in our mind and in our heart and through our eyes. You, you got a millennial generation right now, this is a fascinating statistic, that are more concerned today in this hour. Here's how far we've drifted away from the truth of God's word. A millennial generation that is more offended that you don't recycle than they would be offended that you cheated on your wife. Only 30% would be offended that you cheated on your wife. 60%, upwards to 64% are offended that you don't recycle. That's how whacked the world has become. But the Lord declares, and not in the Old Testament, actually in the New, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he shall also reap. And so the psalmist as well as here, Solomon in the book of Proverbs says, don't be sowing seeds or dropping breadcrumbs or, or, or devising some type of a scheme of a justified path that leads to lust's door. Don't be knocking on that. Don't be thinking that somehow this is all meant to sort of keep your marriage excited and enticed and you you're borrowing from the coals of hell if you think you're keeping your marriage warm by lusting after someone other than your wife and so knowing that satan is out to pursue learn the steps to avoid david's downfall and apply that passage there in Proverbs 7. Take it to heart. Fill this in with me. Stop it cold. Find a guy even tonight. Find a guy in groups this Tuesday morning. We'll be meeting together 7 a.m. And I'll be leading you as we jump back into the book of Acts. Lord willing. Wednesday night, right here in the sanctuary, guys. Gathering together. Put it on your calendar. Put it on your phone. It's Wednesday at 6 p.m. Stop this cold. This is a full-on assault, warfare of the enemy against your soul, against your heart, against your destiny, and certainly against your marriage. Stop it cold. It shall not be dignified with a second look. Might have seen it, might have caught a glimpse, hard not to, but you can control whether or not you dignify that by then feeding it with a second look. David falls for then being captivated by saying, ah, you know what, I, I'm actually supposed to be at war right now, but, well, I don't know, I've just kind of found my schedule to be freed up, and I think I'll just maybe, well, I don't know, I'm just kind of feeling led back up to the roof again. Stop it cold. Bar the, the door. Don't dignify it with a second look. Stay clear and steer away from what tempts you. I remember years ago with Mike and, and uh, Steve and uh, I remember Pastor Larry uh, Peltier was a part of our school of evangelism. We were all heading out to Palm Springs to do an outreach during spring break. And um, it, was, it, it was quite the scene if you remember back in the day. It was kind of the West Coast version of, of Daytona Beach. And I get this 
I get this voicemail on my phone from Larry, from Pastor Larry, and he's like, Bob, I ain't making it. And I'm like, oh, really? While we were counting on you, we kind of thought you'd be there, the whole school of evangelism, you know, being out there to help witness. And, and he's like, I know the limits of my temptation. And I'm going to sit this one out. I was so proud of him, never forgotten that. But ultimately, he was willing to fess up and say, this thing still has its hooks in my heart. And I need to steer clear. I need to, I need to steer away. I need to I, I, stay away, stay clear from what tempts you. And know this, fill this in. There's fullness of life in keeping his commands. Actually, the enemy wants to convince you that the opposite is true. That you're actually being robbed of the fulfillment of life and, and happiness and, 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 and joy by following God's word. Nonsense. B.S. Listen, there is fullness of life. Who knows that to be true tonight, guys? Listen, keeping his commands, pleasures forevermore. Paul writes about it and says, you can't even begin, guys, to dream up or conceive of all that the Lord has in store for us. Hallelujah. There is fullness of life in keeping his commands. So I get it, fill this in. I, there's a millennial generation, there's some challenges. I got folks that want to show up and get paid just for being here instead of actually doing their job. And ages may change. Cultures may change. It seems to me that we are headed into the same depravity as a nation that destroyed Rome. It imploded. Over the same gunk, over the same smut that's destroying our country. And so cultures may change, ages may change, but sin is still sin, guys. Sin is still sin, and God is still God. And he won't be mocked. What he says goes, even in 2024. And so make this your prayer, I'll walk in holiness. Fill that in. Make that your prayer as you're writing it down. I'll walk in holiness to the honor of his glorious name. Holy is his name. We sing holy, holy, holy. And so I love that Nathan cares enough, that the Lord cares enough that, to send Nathan to David's side to help him out of the trench. He's completely dismantled things, derailed his life, and destroyed his witness, at least in that moment, and yet here's the Lord wanting to restore, and he writes some of the most beautiful psalms as a result of that restoration process. And when Steve fell, a lot of you who know his testimony, we put him in the penalty box for five years. He said, you can't be a pastor, man. This can't tolerate. We love you. This is your church. And we embrace our, our arms around and protect your marriage and want to see it succeed, want to see it sustain, don't want to see it crumble, don't, don't want to see it fail, but he ain't pastoring. And he went off and sold insurance for five years. You can tell the story a whole lot better than I can. But when I was told the story, I was coming back from being at conference in Sydney, Australia, and I got the text, my phone just blew up when I landed at LAX of what had happened in Steve's life. And so distraught I was, I, I literally scratched my, my face. It's just like, like, just, ah, oh, it was just so 